Hey, so welcome to Thursday night, Global Peoria, PayWack. And uh, we've done a few of these and I think they seem to be pretty well done. We're gonna be here from seven till, or from uh, yeah, seven o'clock to 7.55. So all of us can scatter and watch round three of the debate or round two, if you prefer. Don't forget to vote coming up in 10 or 12 days. That's of most import. Uh, tonight, we're gonna to discuss two topics. Uh, Dr. Richard McDonald is gonna talk about the infectious disease, COVID. He is a Peoria doc and an infectious disease specialist, graduated from the University of Chicago uh, Med School and has been practicing here since the mid seventies. And in our second half hour, our very own Don Samford is going to talk about polling. As always, uh, Angela will mute you all. And if you have questions, I would ask uh, you to put them in the chat function and we'll moderate them that way as they go along. That seems to work best. Uh, so particularly, Dr. McDonald, uh, I've noticed in the last few days that Europe is exploding. Can you tell us what the hell is going on? Well, um, in the United States, we've, you know, we had a second blip, which a lot of people labeled uh, uh, number two. So now we're talking about number three. But in reality, in Europe, they're experiencing um, a second wave. And uh, I get, once they had gotten through their rather rigorous lockdowns in a lot of places, um, you know, they're, uh, they have tried to really open up and, and maximize their economy as far as they could. And um, uh, they are now experiencing sharp increases in places that already had a lot, but also places that had less of it, like Germany. And um, I think um, they have had uh, increasing problems with uh, compliance, with, with uh, recommended um, distancing, et cetera. Um, you know, the United States, it seems to me we've had it all along, but there I think it's been on the increase substantially from the spring. And so it's a second wave. Um, and their attitude was uh, for a while that I, uh, from my reading was that they, they really absolutely did not want to shut things down again, um, but they are. Um, and I, I noticed that um, Places like Spain are not letting people travel between cities, and and uh, and they've certainly clamped down on who they let into the European Union. And it, you know now you can't go there from Canada anymore. Um, but basically, I think it's you know we we don't have a vaccine, and I think behavior can explain it. And then the, the, the further issue is, um, you know, is, is whether the virus is more transmiss transmissible this time of year. Uh, it certainly continued to transmit through the summer, but as we enter the fall season, you know, perhaps it's more efficient. Why, uh, why would that be? Well, it's a, um, various viruses have, have, uh, there are viruses that transmit most efficiently in the spring or fall, um, and some of them are most efficient in the winter, and some of them can't deal with summer temperatures very well. You remember there was a lot of optimism that this virus would not do well in the summer and that it would really back off, but it really didn't back off that much. Um, and but me personally, I don't have data, but me personally, I think what we're witnessing is more of people's behavior than it is a difference in transmissibility. So if I'd ask you why things have all gotten so bad in Europe, 
your answer would be it's just a normal cycle when people don't separate themselves. Yeah, that's my opinion, yes. Um, I noticed that actually the Times had an interesting story today about the European phenomenon uh, with this disease. And Czech, the Czech Republic and Spain are particularly bad. They're higher than just about any other country. Would you have any reason why those two countries are, uh, are so much higher, particularly the Czech Republic? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I'm not an expert in that. I, I, I really don't know the specific reason. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, well, you know, people talk a lot about uh, multi generational families, and and you know, just the way society is structured. But 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 I'm not that familiar with uh, Czechoslovakia. So John asked an interesting question, which I hadn't thought of. Is does any of this have to do with the political positions of the governments there, whether they're tighter or stronger? And also, as a corollary, the political position of what the United, what they're hearing from the, the states. Oh, heavens. Um, if you don't know, that's okay. <laughs> well, the only comment I would make about that is that it seems to me that it's been kind of a surprise how broad this whole thing is going. Um, you know, it seemed like Germany was doing a better job and et cetera. And, and it, it, the second wave seems to be very, very broad, hitting most places. And um, so I don't have a good explanation for that. And I, I, I doubt if Europe is very interested in copying the, the United States on anything. No, that's especially now. Um, the death rates seem to be lower than the first wave. And I guess I'm wondering if that's because medicine has learned a little bit better how to deal with it. They definitely have. Uh, uh, the, care, the care has gotten better and... Uh, you know, there, there's issues like uh, clotting issues that go on with this disease and, and now patients are rapidly anticoagulated and there's positioning uh, and learning how to keep people off of ventilators if it can be done, et cetera. So yeah, there's, there's better medical care for sure. And what was the other part of that question? I think that was it. <laughs> I can't remember exactly. Uh, oh, there, was, there was another point. Anyway, okay. What, what about, uh, is there anything, I mean, when this initially started, we looked at Italy and we were kind of following their, their spike and we thought, okay, that's, is there anything we can learn now from what's going on in Europe? Well, I'm sure there is, but I haven't read it yet. I mean, I, I, I haven't read anything giving me any good detailed information on um, exactly how people have been acting. Although, you, you know, you, you read things like uh, curfews where, where you close down bars at midnight. That doesn't strike me as the most effective <laughs> way. Um, if you're letting people congregate all evening until midnight, that... It, I would expect transmission. So uh, it seems to me that some of the things that have been tried to keep the economy open um, have probably been too lenient and, and uh, you know, allowed environments, uh, indoor environments in particular, where, where transmission can more readily happen. It's interesting you mentioned the, the midnight curfew in some of those countries because Governor Pritzker just implemented a 10 p.m. curfew in bars and restaurants and some of the hot spots in Illinois, as if that the the the, uh, the virus only comes out after ten o'clock. I'm not sure that's quite exactly correct, but uh, you know it could hope so. Uh, are there any places, any countries that are particularly doing well, either Europe or elsewhere, that we might be able to learn from? Well, of course, everybody's envious of New Zealand. 
Um, but I don't think I don't think we can use that model. I mean, they're small and isolated, and and they've done a fabulous job uh, of eliminating the virus. But but you know I don't I don't think we can trans translate that into something for us. Um, well, obviously, a, a lot of Asia has done a fabulous job, and, and uh, compliance compliance in Asia seems to be very high. They're not having a second wave. Um, they're, yeah, but what they they've had some increases, but we're talking about little tiny increases. Um, a lot of a lot of those countries are just doing extremely well, and and um, but they they're doing things. Um, you know, they've worked out uh, appropriate procedures. Uh, their testing is excellent. That they. Uh, isolate people, they, you know, they're right on top of things. And we've never really worked out our testing system in America to, to work properly. It's way too slow. So, you know, I want you to imagine a future with me. Uh, it's two weeks, Joe Biden is elected president or even Donald Trump. And he hears about this infectious disease doctor in Peoria who's really got a lot of answers. And that's you. And you get appointed the head of the NIH or the CDC or any of those <laughs> alphabet groups. What are the three things you recommend that they do? Well, I, number one, I, you know, we could have radically better testing. We could have radically more, uh, we could, it could be rapid, uh, so you get the result and, and then you have to act on that result um, in, in terms of quarantining people and, and um, prop, appropriate isolation for exposed people, et cetera. You, got, you know, we've, we've not done that well. And, and uh, does radically better testing mean more people? Does it mean more rapid response? What does it mean? Uh, it means mostly rapid result and rapid response. Um, you know, uh, um, I think most of America has had um, contact tracing that has not been very well done. And in some places, and, and if you have large numbers, you, you can't accomplish it. I mean, like when New York got hit in the spring, there's no way that you can handle that except for basically trying to put everybody in, into quarantine. Um, but if you're talking about lower levels of disease, then, and you're getting, you know, people that, that uh, you can do screening, but certainly anybody with any compatible illness, if they get a rapid result and, and, a, and a rapid contact trace and appropriate, um, uh, isolation for people who have been exposed, um, you know, you can really alter the transmission uh, uh, rate. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that would be high on the list. Um, That's one. What about number two? Number two. Well, I don't, uh, you know, we're remember we're doing, I mean, the whole therapy vaccine thing is being done and people are impatient and it's going to take longer than people wanted to, but that's already being done and, and needs to be supported fully. Let me go back to one for a second. Why is the testing so insufficient? Why is our government not been able to do a better job of that? Is it purely political or are there scientific or medical reasons? Oh, it's purely political. Okay. I mean, we, we've had unbelievable uh, lack of leadership. Well, that's for sure, but I didn't know if that, so if we wanted to have more rapid and more significant number tests, we could have that right now. Yes, we could. Okay. That's good to know. 
but, but you have to have leadership saying we're going to do it. Yes. So, okay, so one is that, two is the vaccine, and three is... Would you, let me ask. Let me ask you a leading question. Would you do anything with the economy? Oh yeah. Well, so <laughs> I'm an infectious disease doctor, but um, remember we waved the magic wand. You you have control to recommend. Um, well, you, you know, I think it's pretty phenomenal how many people um, in this country are out of work, not paying their rent, et cetera. And, and uh, um, I, I would be personally strongly in favor of, of doing much more stimulus than, than has been done. Um, I, I think we need to support the economy. I mean, that doing that does a tremendous amount of supporting the economy and um, and we, you know, we know we have months, months more that we're, we're probably not going to be getting good news for a while. And even if, even if somebody pops up and says we're getting good vaccine results, it's still going to be months before any good comes from that. So, so uh, yeah, I would say stimulus. And, and as part of that, do we need to tell restaurants, bars, other businesses where people gathered. We're not doing that. I mean, that's, ex I mean, I know some things that were done in China were much more extreme test, you know, testing, taking people's temperatures, monitoring where they're going. You know, we don't have that sort of society, but that's my understanding is how they got their hands around it. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the question, I, I, in my mind, the restaurants should not be open. I mean, it, we simply shouldn't be gathering, with just about any type of gathering we should not be doing. Um, you know, the, there's, you can do some outdoor gathering and outdoors is much better than indoors. Um, and, but then, you know, the, the obvious enormous economic consequences of having a policy like that. Um, I mean, you really have to dig in and say, how on earth can we deal with that? Uh, deal with the economic consequences of, of essentially telling people they can't work. Um, and that, which is where you get into the massive stimulus concept. So if, let me get you a couple questions here that we have. Uh, Don asked two good ones. He said, if we use mass, had more rapid testing and did a serious job of contact tracing. Could we do, could we do isolate quarantine instead of a larger shutdown? Isolated quarantines instead of a larger shutdown. And would that be a, an effective strategy? It, um, it would be an effective strategy in areas at the lower end of the scale of, of how much disease is currently going on. When you get to larger amounts of disease in a community, um, you probably can't make that work and, and leave everything open. Um, but but th that that absolutely should work in places that have or on the lower end of the scale of how much disease they're seeing. But that that is Mike Chuckle. That that's important to do. Continue. The masking and the hand washing and the masking in particular be more stringent about that is that correct it is i mean i i don't know i i've i've just been dumbfounded about how this has become so political and and you know people uh it's, it's you know it seems like some people marching around without masks um <clears throat> you know that it's an outright political statement of some kind i don't know um but for sure it's it's a very negative thing in terms of an infection control aspect um yes i mean everybody ought to be doing the distancing and the masks and the hand washing and um avoiding uh 
congregating indoors. Uh, and we would definitely be better off. And, and I guess my basic feeling is that a lot of this second wave going on right now is a measure of, of how poorly we have done that. Okay, let me let me change some subjects here. Donna, what, what is your take on the U of I saliva rapid test? Is that effective, worthwhile? Don't know. Oh, were you asking me? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said something else. Um, <laughs> I've, uh, I'm not up to date. Uh, uh, my understanding, my understanding is that um, uh, the test is pretty good. And it, it's in when you do that, uh, you, you accept that there'll be that kind of test will have some false positives, so so that it, it, it's not a perfect test, but you capture a lot of any disease that pops up, and and it's rapid, and you immediately respond to that, and and that's exactly what you need to do, and. Um, my understanding, you know, they kind of got caught over there with, you know, with behavior problems of, of uh, um, students uh, socializing and breaking their rules um, more than, you know, they had thought. I mean, they had, they had, they had, they had actually worked in their model that behavior wasn't going to be perfect, <laughs> but it wasn't, but it was even worse than their model. And Who would have thought college students not following the rules? Yeah. Oh, boy, I can't imagine that. <laughs> but but basically, I think I think that the U of I model is probably one of the best models out there. I mean, for a, for a campus with that many students, and I I believe they were testing them three times a week or something like that. I mean, yeah. it was just yeah. amazing, and and that's a, a huge commitment. And and I, you know. I commend them for their program. So that leads me to wonder about the rapid test that's being used in the White House, which is also immediate, but or close to, but they say it's only 50% accurate. And if a test is 50% accurate, what good is it? The, the um, a fundamental principle in medicine um, is, um, if you're using something as a screening test and you get a positive, then you immediately go to a better test. You, you go to a test that has that that's much more likely to be correct. And you should not you should not be repeating a, a screening test if you've had a positive. You should go to a test that that is more definitive. Right, but the problem, the concern is if you get a negative. You think you're in the clear, but in fact, it's only 50% correct. Well, yeah, I, I can't speak too much about that exact test that they're doing. I mean, if that's, um, that's not a very good screening test if it, if it misses 50% of infections. Um, there, there are better ones. Are, are we, uh, is there any concern about getting complacent if testing was broader? I'm negative, I'm in the clear, I don't have to worry? Well, yeah, certainly. I know you're not a psychologist, but that's, <laughs> you're the only doctor in the room. <laughs> yeah, certainly, I, th I, I think some people misinterpret information. I mean, obviously, if you have a negative test, that's great, but, but you're, you know, you're still at risk of acquisition and, and, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure that some people are, are going to put too much emphasis on, well, I had a negative test, you know, three weeks ago or something like that. Hi, I've got another question for you. Before I do, Angela, I'd like you to unmute and then say what you wanted to say about Spain and the Czech Republic and North Dakota, three very similar places. <laughs> Well, I was listening to the news this morning and they reported that one in 37 people, North Dakota, like New Zealand, doesn't have a tremendously large population, but one in 37 are positive for COVID. 
and they they're it's overwhelming their medical facilities. They just don't have the capacity for that many sick people. Um, and they said if it was an independent country, North Dakota would have one of the highest um, positive rates in the world. So um, that's a little disturbing. Um, and then they had a story about Montana in a similar situation where they're overwhelming the medical capacity in the state of Montana. And they, they juxtaposed it with these images of the hospitals. They've turned offices into, you know, um, ICU and, and they're doubling up on um, rooms that, that should be for single people because they just don't have any more space. And then here's the bars with everybody sitting around the bar, you know, leaning in and talking loud and having their beer. And I don't know why the positivity rate's going up, but the same is true of Spain and, and Czechia. You know, um, Czech Republic actually has doubled its number of cases in the last two weeks from, from the beginning back in March or so to today, the Czech Republic doubled its cases in the last two weeks alone. And I think it's um, that the, the idea that we were just talking about, I think people got complacent and, you know, oh, we don't have a bad outbreak here in Czechia. So no big deal. So we'll, we got to get our economy started. We got to get tourism back on track. Um, you know, Oktoberfest is coming up, <laughs> whatever. And, um, and so they, they've gone from like 100,000 to 200 plus thousand in two weeks. So, I mean, that's a, that ought to be, you know, a real kick in the butt, but it's not here. I mean, we're, we're increasing our cases all the time and it's not a kick in the butt here. So. Human nature. You want to give a plug for November 6th? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> um, we had last uh, spring, we had scheduled Professor Martin Nicola, who is at, um, well, he's in the Czech Republic, he's in Prague. And he was going to be coming through Illinois doing some research for a new book on Czech and Slovak immigrants to Illinois. We had to cancel. Um, he's going to offer us the, the presentation on populism and nationalism in Central and Eastern Europe on November 6th. And I am going to ask him about that radical um, rise <laughs> in the number of COVID cases in the Czech Republic and what he thinks is going to happen there. So. Okay. Dr. McDonald, I've got one last question for you. Okay. And I will preface it by saying it's an impossible question and unfair. So that Great. being said, so you, you can take that, but let's assume we do better. And what the president is talking about is getting back to normal, which we all want to get back to. In your estimation, if we do better, what's the soonest you see us getting back to normal, whatever that is? Remember, I said it's unfair. <laughs> um, I guess I would say, well, for, if we presuppose that we actually come up with a vaccine solution, and um, I would say one year from now, perhaps. Um, if, the, if the vaccine solution uh, takes longer, then it's just gonna be longer. It, it won't be 21, it'll be 22 um, or even longer. Um, if I could, a quick comment about uh, herd immunity. Um, what I, there was a, I saw a map today, I think the New York Times, um, that, that was looking at places where the medical system is, is getting overloaded. And it, and it was Europe and it was Czechoslovakia. And I think, I can't remember the second part, um, but, but, but I wanna make a comment about the, the, the proposal that we let herd immunity occur and, and just let people get, let younger people get sick and, and develop herd, herd immunity. And, um, and I find that very naive. I mean, we would overrun the medical system if we if people went around getting sick, but even younger people. 
we would um, we would be running out of ICU beds, et cetera, again. And we wouldn't be talking about a couple of hundred thousand deaths. We'd be talking about uh, a couple of million. And 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 increasingly, there's a lot of people with with uh, chronic sequelae of having had COVID. Um, and so it's not just the people that die, but there's a bunch of people with a lot of more chronic health problems. Um, so, so that, you know, you, you originally, when you started that question, you, you were talking about what if things go well, and that's really where we need to be. And, and the, the way to get there is, is um, obeying all the rules, do, doing your mask and your distancing and, uh, Hopefully, ending up with a president that would <laughs> that would do early testing right. And if we got a vaccine that worked, and we were able to manage or master the logistics of getting it out, what percentage of the population would we need to get vaccinated for the rest of us to be safe? That's not entirely known, but it's probably in the sixty or seventy percent range. That's what a lot of people feel about the herd, herd immunity. And if uh, we're four, if we're fifty percent, that's unknown. I mean, we would hope that that would have a definite impact and slow things down. Um, I doubt if that would achieve herd immunity. Most herd immunity occurs at, at higher percents, and and that is a uh, an issue because I think there's a lot of people that may not want the vaccine. There's anti-vaxxers already, but then like the masks, it becomes a political statement. Right. Who knows what's going to happen? We live in curious times. Well, thank you, doctor. You've given us a lot of time and, you know, I really appreciate your candor on this most difficult issue. And hopefully we won't have to gather again in a year to talk about it. <laughs> yes. Okay, number two, Donald Sanford. And he's going to talk about polling. Correct, Don? I sure am. <laughs> okay. So what do we know about the accuracy of polls, uh, particularly in the 2016 election and the lessons learned from there? Well, uh, at Shelley, you pointed us out before. Uh, unfortunately, a great myth uh, has come out that I don't, even talking about tonight, is not going to correct it, that the polls totally missed it. Well, in fact, the polls were actually accurate uh, when you looked at it. What, one of the big things that happens is whenever you see a poll and it says that the lead is, let's say, um, 48 to 45 um, percent. Okay, the thing is, you automatically know, or they all the, all the polls will tell you they have a about a three or three point five percent error margin of error either direction. The reality is, polling companies and everything that I've ever studied and and, and taught about polls when I when I was doing this for uh, uh, teaching about it is that it's it's more closer to probably six percent margin of error. But even at the three uh, percent air, they still were spot on. Uh, I mean, really not much different. The, the average of all of the reputable polls was 2.7 for Hillary Clinton. She won by 2.1. But what people, again, the national election is a popularity contest. It doesn't determine who the president is, the electoral college does. And that's where people got caught. Um, normally, whoever wins the popular vote has tended to win the election. I think we've had now with this latest one, there's been five times that um, the, the popular vote winner has not won. So um, the first thing is you got to pay attention to the margin of error. And your best bet is look at it at, at five, at least five. So that means you could be Instead of 48, you could be 43. And instead of 45, you could be 48. So, so it's really, that's what I was going to ask. If the margin of error is four or five, it's four or five with each number. Exactly. Which means it's double that. 
which means the you know if you're betting on it, it's a fool's errand. Yes, and, if it's and, an all course. And, and right, and it, it's it's kind of like Shelley. I hate to be picking on the uh, the media now. Uh, they used to always point. They always used to include the margin of error at least at like three or three point five percent. Now I don't even hear it mentioned anymore. It's kind of like reporting the first of a scientific study. Uh, well, this study found, well, if it hasn't been replicated, I don't even want to pay any attention to it. But that gets in people's minds. So yes. However, be fair, the polls have been better than their 3.5 margin of error for the most part. The other thing was the state polls. So for people who are paying attention to the state polls, they were a little farther off but except for one state, they were still within the margin of error. Wisconsin, they completely off. They had Hillary up by about, uh, I think it was 6, 6.3, and Trump won by uh, uh, 0 0.7. Um, now, what we can talk in a moment where things went haywire a little bit on this, um, but the, the, other, the other aspect was they stopped polling um, they, they all made a conscious decision that they would not poll the final week before the election. Well, we had one of the largest undecided groups that we've ever had. And bam, when they broke, they broke at the last minute and they broke overwhelmingly for Trump. Uh, and, you know, as a case, and this is not the silent group. And I should mention that there were uh, several studies done uh, and Trump keeps talking about there's these people that won't tell the polls or they lie or they, they're too embarrassed to tell the poll that they're actually for Trump. Not a single one of the studies found that was true. So that, that's another one. There just simply isn't any, any evidence that there's this secret vote out there that's all of a sudden going to show up. It was the undecideds that were the key, not any kind of silent, silent group. Let me it. ask a question about process. Because yeah. in the last 20 years, our lives have changed because of this. Yeah. And there are no phone books that have those. So have the poll, I, I, I believe the polling companies were slow to recognize that or at least adapt to it. Are they now better equipped? Do they call people on cell phones? You're right, Shelly. That was, and that was a disaster for polling for a while. In fact, they didn't even realize it for a while that they were leaving out a large group of people. Um, they used to do a little bit more door-to-door -door surveys along with the calling. Um, the last I saw, I looked this up today, and I think for many of the polling companies, they try to have somewhere, you know, they include more than phone, but on the phones, they try to have at least 27% of their polling data is from um, line phones and at least 16% from cell phones. So they, they try to incorporate that as a minimum, as, as I should say, as a minimum number that they'll have. It still is an issue because you have unlisted phones. The other, the other thing is um, what, what goes into now with, with calling people, uh, and, and especially the new technology where you have caller ID, they found that if you call right after, let's say the debate tonight, that people are more inclined to answer if they think it's a polling company, if they think their candidate won and to answer it. So anything that happens right after a debate may get be skewed. So you have to be a little careful on that one. I, I'll mention the other big thing that they, they fouled up though in the last one is a shift that nobody saw. They, they had underrepresented, uh, underrepresented younger voters who were um, low educated, white, low educated. They have traditionally been with the Democrat party. And so polling companies never, they just, oh, college educated, whatever, they're all basically the same. Um, no, and that, that it, it turned out that low educated white voters went overwhelmingly for Trump. They weren't in the polling data. In 2018, they corrected, they went back through all their mechanics. 2018, the polls were about as accurate as they've ever been. But they're still, are we picking that up or are the polls skewed 
more to Democrats than they are Republicans. They're still concerned. We actually won't know that probably until this election's over. And what is your what is your answer to that question? Well, I mean, that's that's what happened. Right. But do you believe, I mean, that the polls are skewed for one party versus the other? They they can be because higher educated tend to vote Democrat. Right. What other last minute changes have they made this year versus four years ago? All right. I'm going to scroll down on my notes on that one. Um, all right. Well, I, I will mention again, we, ha we do have fewer undecideds this time. So they're not going to have near the impact that they had last time. So that's another reason they think the polls will be more accurate. Uh, as I said, they, they uh, tried to account for the the white, also I'll mention 90% of uh, whites voted for Trump last time. Current polling is looking at that number somewhere between 67, 70% of whites for Trump this time. Um, now, Trump's an incumbent this time. He wasn't last time. He's got a record to run on. And the polling companies have, kind of, have all kind of pointed out COVID-19 is weighing heavy on voters right now. That wasn't an issue that Trump had to deal with last time. And Biden's margin uh, has been consistently higher than Clinton's has uh, this entire time. Um, hers was always back in that margin of error. I think Biden came close to hitting that 50% mark once or twice. That's a key mark because if you hit 50%, um, you're in, you're in really good shape. I mean, Trump, most everybody says Trump's going to get his 43 to 46 percent uh, for the national vote. But the key is he won by a few thousand in a couple of the swing states. So you swing that just a little, well, will it in those swing states or not? Again, everything's in the margin of error. Um, and Amy Walter from the Cook Report said the, the big thing still for the polls goes back to, she said, the biggest dividing line that they see is the low educated uh, versus the higher educated. And that's at a number they haven't seen before. What about the surge in early voting, which is like five and six times higher? What impact will that have on the polls? Yeah, er early voting has never had any impact in the end, end results before. Everywhere I read is COVID-19 is got everybody scratching their heads. We're, we're not sure what voter behavior is going to be. The, all these lines you see right now, well, it appears it might be, you know, a lot of them are Democrats, uh, and, but Republicans in the polls have said in very large numbers, they're going to vote on voting day. And a lot of it comes back to uh, Trump talking about uh, fraud, uh, for mail-in ballots and so on. The, and, I, and I should mention, Shelley, the, the big thing that nobody ever knows is voter turnout. Um, so the polls may be 100% correct, but if those voters don't show up to the poll and vote, well, okay, you may have been accurate. These people said, well, this is my preferred candidate, but it doesn't show up at the uh, voting booth. Um, this has happened sometimes in close, especially on state races, uh, where, where the poll predicted one, but the voters didn't show up for it. Let's do our own poll here. I've got you on the gallery so I can see the folks with their videos on, not Alan or Beverly or uh, B. Ramirez or Bonnie Martin. But if you've already voted already, which not who, but raise your hand if you voted early. Okay, so that's one, two, no. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think nine of the 16 of us by my informal poll. That's, it's interesting. I was sitting around outside at a restaurant with a bunch of golfers I was playing with, five or six, and every one of us had, had voted. Uh, I, I think this, this is what makes a big difference. Is that <laughs> yeah. is, uh, you bet. They moved everything up. Uh, or it's longer. 
we've, we've got more, to, because of COVID-19, you've got longer to go for, for early voting. The other thing is the emotion. Um, there, there's talk that even with COVID-19, which they thought might suppress the vote, uh, we may have record turnouts uh, because the emotion on both sides is high this time. The, the other thing you can't minimize is Joe Biden is so much more in the favor, uh, favorable uh, likability ratings than Hillary Clinton. Uh, she was just so low in that area. So that's one reason the undecided is it was just kind of that last minute, I just can't vote for Hillary. Um, I think a lot of those have already decided that they would go for Joe. There's no last second, you know, in, in that. And so that's another key thing I think the polls are showing too. And, and what do the polls tell us about voter behavior and, and the way the polls are trending? Can, can the polls in fact influence yes. what the outcome is gonna be? They sure can. It is why we talk about it being a horse race. If the polls are trending, there's been a, several, uh, both sociology studies and psychology studies on this to back this up. Americans like to go with a winner. And that's why you see, you know, like when the White Sox won the World Series, I saw all kinds of people that I didn't know were White Sox fans. They never told me that before. I love uh, the White Sox fans. Yeah, it's the, the bandwagon effect. You know, all of a sudden, when they're a winner, people come out, and even if they didn't like the, or follow the team, but I'm with a winner now. Uh, Americans don't like to admit it, but our behavior is that. Well, polling is no different. When, when you get polls really trending, um, then Americans tend to go. Now, my, my own personal question is, I've never seen the country so polarized like it is right now. And... I don't know if that's going to have as big an impact as it historically has had. I, again, will be interested to see the evaluations after. The other thing is too, Biden has to worry because people will not go vote if they think their candidate is going to win. And we saw that when, um, I should have looked this up. I'm sorry, it's in my old unit notes that I couldn't find everything. There was one, one of the elections where the media called the election before the polls on the West Coast uh, had closed. California in particular, people, they, they found in their surveys two things. Number one is a lot of people changed their vote for president and voted for the winner. Other people turned around and went home. Now, all of that has an impact on down ballot as well. So right now you have a lot of Democrats that are competitive in states, but they're really tight races. And so if you get some people saying, well, man, everybody's telling me Biden's going to win and they don't go, that has an impact on several people. And this is why Trump's really trying to, you know, Jenny and say, I'm coming, I'm coming. Polls are tightening. And um, it, it will influence some voters. Michelle thinks the uh, year you're talking about is Bush v. Gore, which would be 2020 when they started calling races a little prematurely, I think. Well, so this was long before that, because then, then uh, they FCC, they pla passed a rule that they cannot call the race before the polls are closed now on the West Coast. So mean, the, po the polls were closed. They just screwed up from their exit polling. Uh, right, but they call the races when the states close. They don't call necessarily. Right, and and the one I'm talking about, they called it before the uh, western states oh, closed. Alaska the before the polls there closed. I yes, guess. and it and and it definitely dramatically. It didn't change, obviously, president, but it dramatically changed the downstate. Uh, I should mention too another thing that will drive voter turnout is uh, down ballot initiatives and down ballot contest. Uh, I'm trying to remember which state has a marijuana one on it. So they may see, they may see their younger people turn out in larger numbers. Young people tend to not vote in good numbers. The Democrats traditionally have a voting base <clears throat> that doesn't vote. Uh, the African-American community has a low voter turnout rating. Uh, young people have a low vote out turnout rating. And uh, that is two of their largest constituencies. So, so will Don, they vote? Don, let me ask you this. You spent your career teaching high school students. 
mm -hmm. who were turning 18 and getting the right to vote. Now, maybe earlier in your career they didn't, but explain that to me why they don't vote. Well, Shelley, I go back to uh, the Vietnam conflict. And, you know, we finally got the right to vote. You know, I, I, you know, I didn't protest, but I remember my age, everybody was out protesting. Hey, we're going to fight and die in Vietnam. We ought to have the right to vote at 18. As soon as that amendment was ratified, virtually none of them voted. So this, this has been, we don't have a magic answer. They just don't seem to get very civic minded. You have a handful, but most of them until they get older, just. <laughs> yeah, the managing editor at the newspaper used to tell me that uh, he didn't worry too much about people not buying the paper because when they were young, because by the time they were in their early 30s, they had bought a house, they had kids, they started paying taxes. That's when they became not only newspaper subscribers, but voters <laughs> as well because it affected them directly. And their 20s were concerned about other things. So, Angela, you have an answer. You're, you're hanging around college students. Why don't they vote? I would have to challenge um, the, the broader premise of why don't they do anything. So, um, you know, they can live in a dorm floor or fraternity sorority and half their house will be racked with the flu. And I'll ask them, oh, you know, how many of you got the flu shot? You know, 20% of, of Bradley students get a flu shot. They don't do anything unless it directly affects them, like for their resume or whatever, or I offer extra credit. So when I taught political science, I offered extra credit if they would be poll workers or if they would vote and get that little, you know, I voted sticker, then they showed, out to, showed up to vote. And the one guy was a, you know, returned to college after, you know, 20 years as a police officer. He was going back to become a psychologist. And he said, I never voted before. <laughs> like, your job is paid for by taxes, dude. Really? <laughs> you didn't think it was important to go weigh in on that? I don't know. I don't know why young people don't vote. I mean, seriously, there is they there there are so many things they don't do, but that they do do other things. You know, they volunteer to protest. They, you know, work with kids in the schools close to Bradley's campus. But I don't know why they don't vote. You so, are making an argument because I think Don and I are about the same age, but you're making an argument to reinstitute the draft. You reinstitute <laughs> we'll get them voting. And I guarantee you, when we were, when I asked, we were on the line, we were going to Vietnam, we were paying attention. Yeah. Well, here's a, uh, a discussion I like to have with my students. Why is the drinking age 21 when you guys, you college students, clearly would like to drink legally at your age? Why is the drinking age 21? What do you guys think? Because they don't vote. They don't have any power. Exactly. They don't vote. They don't elect anybody who would change the voting or drinking age to twenty to 18. They, they don't so, lobby. <laughs> I, would, I would say there's a second reason, Angela, and it's they do it anyway. So the law That's doesn't true. make a difference. Or drive across to Wisconsin. Well, yeah. I'd like them to be rebels and vote too, you know? <laughs> hey, Shelly. Yes. Uh, before we run out of time, Angela's got a question here. I def I forgot. I really want to address tonight too. This is the oh, other boy. thing. Polls think that they are are closer. She's asking about the Bernie factor, yeah. uh, the Libertarian and Green options. The Libertarian had two Republicans running, and they definitely had an impact. Um, and um, on the Green option, uh, Jill Stein was very interesting because, and we we brought this up in the program we had with Nina is that there just was quite a bit of evidence that she was a bit of a Russian plant. Uh, she was, uh, she announced her candidacy on RT. Uh, she spent a lot of time with Russian affiliated things and you didn't need to swing the vote very much as we have seen in, in some of these states. So uh, this time the libertarian isn't as strong 
that's why we have less, I think, undecideds as well, uh, that, that people have made up, made up their mind. And, and again, because Trump had four years, uh, people didn't know him before. So, you know, it was, it, it's a little bit easier for people to decide. Yeah, one of the things that is most distressing about the 2016 election is not only in you know three states, 77,000 votes decided the outcome. And in those three states, the number of voters that either voted for a third party candidate or skipped the presidential vote and voted just down ballot were hundreds of thousands. I think in Wisconsin alone, there were like 250,000 voters that did not participate in the presidential election. And yeah. we just 10 times as many we needed to swing it. So, you know, those are of... a lot different this time. Yes. And, okay. and, and, and two things real quick, Shelly, that are new as well, is we, we just don't know what Trump's ballot fraud issue is, is going to, to cause. But the militias now, that are at these voting. We don't know the voter suppression, which if you saw Frontline this week, uh, the, the big guy behind uh, the Republican issues of voting uh, says that that's a made up term, but there is a big movement out there to suppress, especially Democrat votes. Um, and with these militias outside, are people going to be afraid to go even er early voting? Nobody knows. Uh, you know, right now. But those are all issues that will be looked at. Don, you get the last word. Four minutes of debate. Fire away. Oh, Some well, that, that was pretty, that was my last point. But, oh, to, well, tonight, if, will it swing any last undecided? Um, I don't think so, except, you know, can he lay enough dirt on Biden that, you know, or in, I should say innuendos and, and insinuations I don't think that's, I think too many people have made up their mind that the ones who believe it are already listening to Fox and Rush Limbaugh and so on. The people who don't believe it are already listening to MSNBC and CNN, and they don't even know about some of it. So I, I just don't see tonight is, is going to have much of an impact. As long as something cataclysmic doesn't happen, you're absolutely right. Which is that October surprise that Trump keeps trying, praying. That, or Biden passes out or... You know, well, true. There are, there are goofy things that could happen. Yep. All right, Angela, you want to say goodbye? I do. And I want to tell you that college students don't vote and college students don't get vaccinated. We're doomed. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I would like to thank Dr. McDonald and Don Tamford for a very lively discussion tonight of two very pressing issues. Um, Dr. Your expertise is great. most welcome. I'm, I'm sorry? sorry? Dr. McDonald, you were great. Thank you very yes. much. Yes, yeah, exactly. thank you. Don't forget to join us tomorrow. You do need to register, but it's free for the program on Iran with Ambassador William Lures at 11 o'clock tomorrow. Um, I'm guessing we'll have a little bit of commentary based on whatever is discussed tonight at the um, at the debate. So I didn't, you know, mute Don or Dick while they were talking or Shelley. But if you all want to go be entertained, let's go watch the debate and see how that turns out. So thank you all. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Um, the second Thursday, second and fourth Thursday for this global PRA discussion. Thank you, Shelley, as, uh, as always, an expert discussion.